Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this session on the Gender Equality Audit and Monitoring Tool that has been co-organized by the Gender Equality Academy and the ACT Project. I'm Marina Cacace from Knowledge and Innovation, partner in the GE Academy Project. The, the GE Academy Project was funded by the European Commission to deliver a comprehensive capacity building program on gender equality in research organizations uh, through a variety of formats like in-person trainings, workshops, summer schools, distributed open collaborative courses, interactive webinars, and train the trainer sessions. You can check for our website for more information on our next sessions. As to the ACT project, it was still funded by the European Commission to promote a series of community of practices to advance knowledge, collaborative learning and institutional change for gender equality in the European research area. And you can see the partners in the consortium on the slide. The today's session, session one in a series of three, is devoted at providing an introduction to the tool, so a general understanding of its purpose, architecture, components and workflow, and an introduction to its key concepts. It will be followed by two sessions with a more practical orientation and uh, hands-on technical practice. The, the first session now, um, these slides is to present the GIM credits, so those the authors and those who have built the, the, the tool together with the languages it has been already translated into. Uh, today's speakers uh, is Jörg Müller from the University, Open University of Catalonia in Barcelona, who is also the coordinator of the ACT project, together with Sergi Janes, who will, be, who will be facilitating the session. Uh, Jörg, the floor is yours. Well, what is the GAM in a nutshell, the Gender Equality Audit and Monitoring? I mean, we started developing these tools following a simple baseline assumption that many people who work on gender equality um, do not necessarily have a uh, background in social science and uh, survey development. So there are people that are working in the bioscience and physics and uh, in different disciplines and social science is not necessarily their specialty. So we thought it might be a good idea to ease uh, and compress the instruments that we use to gather data on gender equality in an organization and make sure that this instrument is, is really solid. There have been many, usually all the structural change projects have at their initial stage uh, an audit, a, a sometimes involving a survey. And often these surveys are reinventing the wheel because uh, more or less what we want to know concerns the typical uh, problematic areas of gender equality about work-life balance, um, how gender equality is handled within an institution, but uh, it's not necessarily clear how to best ask about these things and get uh, good data. So what we did, we reviewed uh, existing surveys and existing measurement instruments and uh, made a selection, put these together uh, and made this available through the GAM tool that you can use these instruments, which we think are really recommendable and, and provide good uh, quality data. We also put considerable effort into, you know, making this comparable that they work across different country contexts um, in order that people, you know, from Spain, but also France or Poland can use the survey equally. There's still always a customization involved, but we tried, you know, to find some core elements that could be used relatively in an in unproblematic way. This work was based on the Athena Server for Science, Engineering and Technology, which has been conducted in the UK and it's been developed by the Advanced HE. So we use this as our baseline, um, complemented this with new models and measurement instruments uh, through a literature review and um, put this together as, as, a, as the GAM infrastructure. So it really should help you to gather high quality and comparable data in your institution 
without going through the difficult process of developing a questionnaire, validating it, and uh, then may, maybe ending up with data that actually are not uh, too good quality or you can't really say much about what's going on in your institute. I think we have to understand that uh, the GIAM forms part of a uh, gender equality audit that you usually carry out when you start developing a gender equality plan in your organization. And there are different data sources involved. So usually what you do, you have focus groups with uh, top management, uh, postdocs, you do individual based interviews, you know, with specific, uh, I don't know, students, academics or people from HR. You probably might want to also carry out a text and image analysis, for example, for job announcements, you know, how biased these are, the wording in there, you know, you might want to revise some pictures used on the organization's website, you know, how stereotypical these are. Um, you definitely need to talk with human resources, of course, in order to get an overview on the gender distribution across uh, different staff roles and, and, and the hierarchy, of course. But you also need um, a survey because it provides you actually another picture, uh, a complementary picture of your organization. So the GAM basically often, you know, it's seen as complementary to the data you get from your HR department. Of course, the HR department, you know, it's very good data if you get access to it because it's centralized, it's reliable, you know, uh, HR knows what type of contracts uh, people have, how much they get paid, um, what type of, where in the hierarchy they stand. So this is, a, this is a solid picture that you get and that you need for your gender equality plan, of course. However, the GIAM, provides an additional picture on data that HR, not necessarily human resource department, doesn't necessarily have. So this concerns the experience of the organizational, the, the reality, the work climate, for example, in your organization. Uh, it concerns experiences of gender-based violence, of sexual harassment. I mean, you might even have a, a protocol in your organization, but people do not report. Uh, and an anonymous survey as the GIAM provides an opportunity, you know, to report this experience, even if you don't know who is affected. Uh, but it, it might give you another indicator that there is a problem. Um, it also provides you information of external responsibilities that HR not ne doesn't necessarily have. So how many uh, children people have or if they have to have care responsibility for, for adults, for example. Um, it also gives you a sense of just personal satisfaction, you know, how, how satisfied are people at your organization. So it gives you a whole range of subjective experiences of employees or students that otherwise would be really hard to, to access. Um, the disadvantage, of course, I mean, you know, it, it consumes additional resources. You still have to adapt the GAM, you have to, you know, launch it, several waves, reminders. So it's, you know, additional work, so to speak. But I would say it's definitely uh, provides a very rich and necessary layer of the reality in your organization regarding gender equality. When we talk about, when we look at this from uh, the different phases that we have in, in gender equality plans, usually you would use the GM at uh, the first step. So as part of an in initial audit, for example, when you analyze and collect and want to diagnose the situation of gender equality in, an, in, in a university or research institute, then usually you plan, you know, um, device actions that address the challenges and gaps you have identified, you implement these. And then in the final step, you monitor the outcomes of your actions. And there it might be, again, 
an opportunity to uh, use the GAM because ideally you would detect a certain change from the initial stage to the other one. So this could be a part three years, basically, two years, three years, four years. And uh, the important thing is that if you have an instrument that is really reliable, uh, the changes you detect, uh, you know, they're likely to be not an error caused by your instrument because simply your instrument is so bad, one time it says A, a the next time it says B, you can't be sure what actually happened. So if you have a valid instrument, it's better to work with and see actually if any of the measures that you implemented uh, actually had an effect. So the GAM provides you insights basically about individual experiences of employees, as I said before, for example, for example regarding sexual harassment. Uh, it also provides you insights regarding the perceptions, awareness, and beliefs among employees. Uh, this can, for example, concern perceptions of uh, gender equality, you know, if they perceive if the organization is really fair. I mean, you might have implemented several measures, but, you know, people still think this had no effect and actually uh, the environment in which they're working is really wanting. The GAM also provides in, insights on factual working conditions. So there are certain items uh, that address, um, you know, types of contract, fixed term or temporary contract, for example. So in case you won't get this data from HR, this might be an alternative to approximate this data as well. And then it provides uh, data on sociodemographic variables major major variables related to social dis discrimination for example sexual orientation this is also a good example where there's a difference to hr data because usually hr doesn't not um, collect data on sexual orientation but since this is really a key dimension of social discrimination so uh, it's important uh, to to cover this in in a survey so it allows you to get a good picture of uh, what is going on in, inside your university or research lab. Um, and then also, based on these insights, prioritize your res resources uh, and measures you want to implement. So the GAM components, if we look a little bit more in detail, mm -hmm. We have structured this according to a GAM core, as I said. And uh, we've also collected during our initial um, review additional modules uh, that can be used and incorporated in the GAM. So, of course, we collect data so on sociodemographics which includes, as I just mentioned, different dimension of social discrimination. So this is age, gender, ethnic minority, sexual orientation, trans history, disability, marital status, and educational level. So this would be socioeconomic status as well. Um, these, these dimensions are important because later on you can, of course, analyze all results of the other measurement scales incorporated according to intersectional uh, criteria. You can look at them just um, using, for example, gender differences, but of course you can also combine this uh, if there is a, uh, a difference in terms of, let's say, a wage gap in terms of age and gender together. Then we ask about uh, working conditions, and uh, I'm going to explain this in the next slide a little bit uh, in more detail. Uh, there are questions on organizational culture and climate. These are really asking about um, respondents' perceptions on gender equality, if they think there's preferential treatment, how recruitment works 
inside your organization. And there's another scale, which we come back to in the future as well. It's about the masculin masculinity contest culture. Um, there is another section then on behavior, interpersonal behavior. There again, we go away from uh, perceptions and we ask about facts. So how people have experienced quite specific indication, quite specific incidents of sexual harassment or microaggressions. Um, so these four sections are included in the pre-installed template, let's say, of the GIAM. But then there are other modules. So there's an institutional model you could use, for example, to just collect the baseline data in general from human resources regarding, for example, at what stage your GAP implementation is. Um, um, you know, human resource data on different job categories and the gender distribution there. So this is simply, it's like in the end, another option to facilitate you thinking about what baseline data you need. And then we have also collected uh, additional questionnaire scales on beliefs and bias. And there we have uh, many social psychological measurement scales, for example, the neo-sexism, ambulance sexism. I mean, there's a whole range of different sexism scales, for example, that we uh, reviewed and included in our review. Or there are other um, uh, scales regarding uh, diversity beliefs, for example, how people think, you know, if the diversity is a good thing or a bad thing. So these we all have in a database. They are collected in, a, in, in the document of our deliverable 2.1, where you can see uh, a little bit further also the explanation behind these. Let me just quickly point out um, in more detail what we've included in the working conditions section component of the GAM. So we have, for example, uh, several items on work-life balance, and these include um, the care responsibilities for adults um, that people might have uh, if they are parent of how many children and if they're a single parent or not, uh, if they have an awareness of the flexible working options inside the organization or if they simply don't exist. Um, then we have several uh, items that we took from the European Working Conditions Survey in terms of career prospects, the motivation, uh, job security and job satisfaction, and uh, work intensity. And then we also use the work family conflict scale, which I will introduce later on in a little bit more detail because it, I think it's, it's a quite good example of what we're aiming for in terms of uh, measurement. Then we have uh, parental leave as well in the working conditions. So if respondents have taken parental leave and uh, which type, when, if there are policies on parental leave available in the organization and uh, also policies for returning to work and how good they were prepared for returning to work. So it's, it's, it's a quite good Actually, it's the most, among the most extensive sections of the, the GM because the whole thing about work-life balance and working condition is, is important from a generous perspective. So it's quite uh, extensive, this section. And we also incorporated during the pandemic, this was not initially uh, part of the GM, but we took on board a module on COVID in terms of you know how uh, work patterns have changed for respondents uh, regarding their responsibilities like research, teaching, conferences, publications, and so on and so forth uh, during during the pandemic. Organizational culture and climate, as I said, this is really about uh, the perceptions of uh, certain items. So we have perception of gender equality, how people in general perceive. Uh, their organization in terms of, you know, if this is really a fair environment for, in term, for gender equality or not. If they perceive that there are differences in the location of resources, and then it's quite fairly extensive because there's like 16 uh, sub items on that. Um, the recognition and appraisal of work, 
Then we have the masculinity contest culture, which I also going to introduce later on in a little bit more detail, and uh, the promotion criteria. So it's, it's, it's a fairly complete picture of how people perceive uh, their work environment. And finally, we also have uh, the section on interpersonal behavior, as I said before. So we provide very specific definitions of what we mean by uh, microaggressions. Um, this is part of the, of the question, so that before people respond, they understand what we are really looking for. So for example, brief microaggression, it's a brief and commonplace verbal, behavioral, and environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative slights and insults to the target person or group. So you provide the division, and then there are 11 sub-items uh, where people can indicate the frequency, we would say, experience. And the same holds for bullying and harassments, where we define what we mean by that, and then ask about if people have experienced this during the last 12 months. And we also ask about if they, how confident they would be for reporting those inc incidents to different, different people. Okay. Um, What's also important is to understand uh, during this initial introduction of the GAM is that the GAM is not just a questionnaire that you can download in Word, but it actually is a integrated infrastructure. What do we mean by that? Um, we are using the survey platform uh, Lime Survey. That's a quite uh, well-known and widely distributed open source uh, survey platform. This survey platform we have uh, downloaded and installed on our servers and uh, basically um, pre-installed uh, the GM questionnaire online already. So you don't need to transfer these questions to you know, SurveyMonkey or Google Forms or whatever. It already comes uh, pre-installed on our platform. We've also provided uh, a specific site for the GAM uh, where we have, where we bundle all the documentation. And this is, pro is the platform from where we create uh, individual accounts for organizations. So if you are an organization, you apply for an account we set up this account on our Lime survey platform, and you are then free basically to do whatever you want uh, with the gear. Uh, this means that you can add your specific questions or remove questions that you think won't apply for your institute. Um, we recommend really that to not modify the questions that are there, the wording of the questionnaires, because some of these question, some of these questions and sub items have been used, uh, have been tested already from other, uh, in other research projects, they have been validated. And um, if you modify these individual questions, uh, you know, they might not work as intended anymore. So I think we usually we think it's good if you want to delete a whole question block or if you want to add your own questions to this, you can do this, of course, but it's a little bit more tricky to um, modify individual items also because the template comes with all the translations uh, pre-installed. So you have from the start, um, you know, the Spanish, the German, the Polish, and all the other translations in the template. So if you add your own question, in a way you are responsible for providing all the translations. You can, of course, delete the languages you think you don't need in your context. This makes it then easier. So you might have a new question in German and uh, you just then provide the English translation. But still, I mean, it, it's quite, um, um, you, you carefully have to think about, you know, what is really not covered by the game, what you want to add, what you want to um, 
remove. Part of the online hands-on training, uh, we will guide you through the sections that we think that need customization of the gear. So for example, there is no entry for the different job categories and roles in the organizations because they you know, change from organization to organization. So there's no sense for us to provide like a, a shared definition or standard because this will change anyway. So it's just an empty question where people then have to provide their own category, categories and job categories. Once the custom, customization is finished, basically you are ready to launch the survey uh, using of all the options that you have in, in, in the Lime survey platform. So there are different means of anonymization, of uh, making waves of reminders, which we also explain, you, explain to you to, during the training. And once this is done, again, um, the advantage of having this shared framework is that we have prepared for you a reporting template, which basically generates uh, the descriptive report in Word for you. So this is a script which is uh, openly available. If you are familiar with, with R, um, you can uh, generate this report yourself. If not, we can also help you with this. Uh, basically what it does, it reads the data from your survey and generates uh, the charge and the frequency tables uh, of all standardized elements, GM core elements, of course, which are contained in the template. So take home points at, uh, for the GM. So the GM is, is part of the ACT project, so it's uh, run on the resources of the ACT project. So it's free to use um, for now until October at least. But the way it's set up, it's also that all the questionnaire or the platform, you can really take this with you. Um, the questionnaire that you set up, you can export it and then import it in any other Lime survey platform. So you, you're not locked into this, let's say. Uh, I think, and we've seen this uh, with the organizations that so far have implemented uh, the survey, that it really saves you time in developing and reporting. So you don't have to go through the whole process of deciding how you ask about this, what is included for doing this initial gender quality audit in your organization. And you also don't have to, you know, generate all uh, the charts and frequency tables all this time gets basically compressed and ideally freed up for thinking about um, interpreting the data, contextualizing the data in your organization and then designing really the, the measures that make sense and address the needs that you have detected through this survey. Uh, as I said, it's adaptable and ready to be customized. And uh, it's also important to emphasize that in the end, you own the data you generate. Um, before you can launch a survey, we have you to sign a data protection agreement. I mean, uh, we as the, the, the WOC, where I work, the organization, we take responsibility for the hosting of the Lime survey platform, of course. So we take responsibility for making this a secure environment. However, the moment you generate the data, you are responsible, uh, you become the controller of this data, which means that you really have to take care that it's stored securely, uh, protected, uh, that you delete it after a certain amount of time, all these um, things that you have to comply with when you really deal with this type of data. In the next session, uh, after the break, there we will also explain, uh, I will explain a little bit the type of data you collect. So there's personal sensitive data involved. So you really have to be sure to understand uh, what this type of data involves. If you are uh, allowed to collect this type of data in the context you operate. So because the leg legislation might be different from country to country. Um, and uh, all this um, forms part of this.
But then still, I think one of the major challenges that remains is really once you have the data and once you have the descriptive um, tables, it's still not easy really to analyze the data more in depth. Uh, you need some experience in statistics um, in order to you know, do the different uh, cross tabulations, detect uh, differences in terms of whatever interests you according to men and women and gender. So this is something this is uh, remains a challenge and it's in any way good if you have, for example, a statistician that can help you with that. Okay, uh, for getting sta started, I mean, this doesn't really apply to this course now, but uh, definitely mm, I recommend you to take a look at the questionnaire. It's online, you can browse it. I hope you can see the, the link here. Otherwise, I would ask Sergi as well to post it into the chat. Um, the questionnaire is online. Uh, it's like how respondents would see it. Uh, you can browse it, jump back and forward, uh, see, examine all its components. And uh, however, the data that you might submit, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be saved. It's just there for documentation and consultation. But this already gives you a good overview of um, the detailed items and questions, uh, which I also then will ask you later on, you know, already think about these in the context of your organization, what makes sense and what not. Then I also recommend to check the documentation. So there is an online manual, a link to the online manual uh, on our main site, which is geam.actongender.eu. Um, there's PDF and a manual that you can browse online, which, you know, explains you basically the entire training uh, in more detail and which also will help us during our practical sessions. You don't need to uh, request an account through this generic email, info act on gender, because I understand that most of you registered already for session two and three. So we will take it from uh, the registration. But this is also something to which I will come back at the end of uh, today's session. <clears throat> um, after we've introduced the basic technical details, let's say, of what is involved or what the GAM really contains, uh, I think this is also a good opportunity to introduce some more uh, theoretical and surrounding concepts, so gender equality, uh, social science concepts uh, of what is involved when you do online surveys. And the first thing I want to talk about, ah, yeah, and let me also say before, before we start, uh, there's going to be another question and answer session towards the end of the second part. So we'll try to respond to all questions that have been posted in the chat. And also then I think it's much nicer if we really can have people to also speak. Um, let's see. So I think one of the questions went in this direction, but maybe I was mistaken a little bit. I think it's quite interesting to introduce a little bit also the discussion regarding, you know, feminist theory and quantitative data. And um, <clears throat> I think it's a contested relation, let's say. Uh, there has been quite a lot of critique uh, regarding quantitative data and, and uh, survey instruments. But it's also, I think, undoubtedly that, uh, you know, there has been quite solid arguments put forward uh, what can be achieved with quantitative data. And I think the prime example in this regard is uh, She Figures, was published by the European Commission, which really, um, you know, documents uh, the gaps and the social injustice, let's say, that uh, still exists in terms of gender equality. So this concerns, you know, the vertical segregation, that the higher up the uh, career ladder you go in science, but also in other areas, you know, the less women usually you find. Uh, it concerns the wage gap, which is quite pronounced still in the European Union. It's about 17 percent. 
think about this. It also concerns, you know, for example, political decision making. Uh, if you go to the gender equality index of the European Institute of Gender Equality, you see it's still at 53% um, taking into account, uh, for example, women as members of parliament or, uh, um, yeah. So there have been really um, quite solid arguments, I think, what can be gained. Uh, with these uh, quantitative uh, surveys and uh, measures. But also, I mean, there have been some important critiques put forward from many gender scholars and feminist uh, thinkers of terms, uh, uh, quantification and survey instruments that um, we can distinguish there. It's like on the, on the one hand, there has been put forward an epistemological critique, let's say, uh, during the 70s and 80s, you know, feminist thinkers like uh, Sandra Harding, for example, or Donna Haraway, they have made the point that although uh, science uh, aims to produce value-free, objective uh, knowledge and uh, with uh, numbers and quantification, you know, it's like the representation of this, of this value-free and objective knowledge, that knowledge in the end is always uh, partial and it's to a large degree shaped by the position in society from where a social group speaks. So as women were incorporated more and more into science, it was quite clear that the knowledge was actually quite uh, biased. Uh, because it didn't represent the experiences of uh, many women that were excluded from this, you know, important area of society of knowledge production. And I think this, um, I think it's easy to appreciate uh, today where we are more or less familiar with uh, the gender dimension of knowledge and the gender innovation projects where we can see how knowledge in the medical field for certain uh, diseases is biased certain medicaments development of many medi medicaments has been biased i think it was quite revolutionary in the 70s and 80s to insist you know all of those science um, claims to be objective and and um, neutral this is definitely not the case and that uh, knowledge is always partial and a lot of the research back then, but even today, you know, is done, uh, is of quantitative nature, is done with survey instruments. So it was only natural to include in the critique against a certain understanding of science, also a critique of the instruments. And I think a lot of rejection uh, against uh, quantitative uh, measures is still in depth to this uh, initial epistemological critique put forward. Then I think there's also a methodological critique. And uh, this basically concerns that if we use um, gender as a variable in, in, in a survey, it, even, it easily it gets confounded between, with sex. So sex and gender are quite often uh, used interchangeably. But even what's more uh, worrisome is that it becomes somehow a stable personal attribute of individuals. <clears throat> and it's like a property that individuals have or have. And as such, we lose sight really that gender is much more uh, than a personal attribute. It's really a structural fault line. It's a major, um, a major force that shapes entire society. So gender is all the time reproduced, redistributing, let's say, um, the access to resources, but also what things are valued. And if we simply understand it as a personal attribute, these larger uh, structuring dimension of gender is uh, easily forgotten. And a very interesting example in this respect is actually diversity research. Uh, you might be familiar a little bit with the literature, but there was a huge um, 
increase in turn uh, i mean there was a huge research going on uh in the united states in the 1980s um, which basically displaced the previous context of uh, thinking about diversity in the workforce in terms of uh, equal opportunities uh, replaced this with a quite clear management approach so diversity was not so much anymore seen from a social justice perspective, so where it's about uh, equality, equal access, but it actually was seen as something that should be put into relation with the outcomes of an organization. So it was all placed into, let's say, a framework of quantification where easily observable uh, features like gender, then become can be related to the outcomes of an organization i mean there are tons and tons of research that look at you know what's the percentage of men and women on a team or inside an organization on the leadership board and then try to observe a certain correlation with the outcome of the organization for example i don't know the return investment or um, how good uh, the publications are that come out of a certain gender balanced research team and so on and so forth. So the whole operation there was to understand gender as a personal attribute that could easily be managed uh, from a human resource point of perspective and a management uh, perspective until really uh, after, I don't know, a decade or even more, you know, it become increasingly dependent that it's not just a individual attribute that we're looking at but also that actually the relations you find inside a team or an organization and uh, stereotypes and ascriptions that people have when they interact among each other uh, are really important for uh, shaping this for shaping the interaction and, and and the social context so people reached this conclusion basically because they saw that the results of a too simple understanding of diversity, uh, they were not consistent. And sometimes, you know, a certain proportion of men and women produce better research, sometimes it didn't. Overall, it wasn't consistent because of course, the question was much too simple. When we talk about gender, it's not just the proportion, but it's actually, you know, the associated status and stereotypes that uh, come with it and that are historically grown and attached to certain groups. So I think it's, it's a quite interesting example because it also shows how the reduction of gender to certain attributes then becomes part of a whole uh, governmental um, framework, let's say, where you try to relate certain input indicators like gender proportion to the overall performance of the team or the organization. Um, there will be other examples on that. In, in Jörg, uh, sorry for interrupt. Just to make sure we are seeing the same slide uh, for yeah. a while now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We don't know if... Yeah. I'm on, yeah, go with the next one, yeah. Okay, okay. Correct. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Correct. So um, closely related to this first is also another uh, critique that, of course, if we think about gender or sex, this is often, uh, you know, used as a binary category. And um, I mean, now it's more common or, you know, more common to actually understand that gender is not just men and women, but you have also transgender, which don't fit neatly into either of these categories. But even for sex, I mean, you know, it's not just men and women, biological sex, but they're also intersex people. So there's a whole, a whole um, variety of other categories that, that uh, are difficult to capture. You only have to think about what would it, what it needs if you uh, ask for a new ID, you know, how many categories you have. This is often not uh, available so it's really hard to to change these binary categories and they are you know very present in quantitative research so these are like the 
some of the main critique points uh, for quantitative research. Um, but there's actually also another issue involved. Um, once we have indicators or once you question, I, they, they acquire like a certain, they become naturalized. So the whole process behind developing indicators, behind uh, categorizing uh, actually becomes invisible and we take the indicator as a reality in itself. I mean, common example is, for example, EQ tests, you know, this is a quite complicated measurement indicator, which we now take to be equivalent basically with, uh, with intelligence of a person or the GDP, the gross domestic product. I mean, there was a period in history where people thought this actually couldn't be measured, but now it's like a standard indicator um, that has become naturalized. And I think it, two examples make this very clear, make the complexities involved when developing indicators very clear. One is from <clears throat> Sally Eagle Mary, which is a very good book on the seductions of quantification, uh, where she basically tells the story of how the UN Statistical Commission developed indicators for measuring um, violence against women on a global scale. And when you read this chapter in this book, it really, you become quite aware, you know, of the lengthy process that was involved in really defining what violence against women means and who gets to decide what is involved and um, how this in the end becomes naturalized and the only way it seems like this has also always been the case. So it's, it's like it really makes visible the power that is involved when designing indicators. And roughly speaking, there are two different approaches. One is about a more gender equality based approach, which looks at also more the context of economic opportunities uh, versus another one, which is more criminal justice based. So this is about uh, better policing, about uh, the prosecution of the perpetrators. And uh, this is also often collected through administrative data. So in their negotiations, which were between the UN Statistical Commission, but also many, many women's rights movement across the globe, there was a constant drawing and, and, and struggle and renegotiation of what should be included and how should it be uh, measured. So in the, in the end, the UN included basically their definition included uh, that, that this should be measured in terms of physical and sexual violence in intimate and non-intimate relationships, um, female genital cutting, emotional, economic violence. But they didn't leave out, and this was critiqued by a women's movement, for example, violence by a policy and military, sexual harassment is not included, stalking, female feticide, early and forced marriage was not included, and uh, violence against pets and property. Um, so you see really, you know, what is included, what is left out is really like crucial decisions in terms of what becomes then visible and what is not visible, what you can hold governments accountable for and what not. And this gets also very uh, um, plastic or you know, very, very illustrative. Uh, when, for example, Bangladesh also wanted to include their very specific forms of violence, for example, related to burning and acid or dropping, at which not were very unfamiliar from people who initially developed this, uh, these indicators which come from Northern European countries. Another example, I think, which makes very good reading in this section is also from uh, Catherine Dignazio and Lauren Klein, Data Feminism. And then basically in their introductory chapter, they look at um, the case of Serena Williams, who um, was pregnant, who gave birth, uh, but it turns out that she had severe complications during uh, her birth which she documented on Instagram once everything was over. But then several women started to note, uh, you know, something went wrong and they started to report as well the complications they experienced during uh, being in the hospital and, and, and giving birth. So 
based on this, there was like a whole uh, follow up by the press because Serena Williams, of course, is a tennis star. And uh, a whole issue evolved around that there's actually no measurement in place on uh, complications during uh, pre-maternal and during maternity in, in, in hospitals in the US 2017, uh, this was. And that in the end, actually, um, black women are three times more likely to die uh, in the hospital than, than white women. I mean, there were no indicators and the, the situation is still quite uh, scare in terms of indicator because in a way, the, what we measure and what we put on display is of course what we value. And this case is very interesting as well because it's from an intersectional perspective where you see that it's invisibility because it's woman, it's double invisibility because it's black woman where you have uh, race and gender intersect. But then there's this additional twist of celebrity. So of course, Serena Williams uh, took advantage of her um, celebrity status to get the ball rolling and get uh, things moving in this in this regard. So it's a lot about you know the way we construct indicators and what we measure them. There's, it's a question of, of of power in the end. And this is is the implications of this are very well analyzed by the initial book on the seduction of quantification, but also by in this book of Marilyn Strathen on all the cultures, uh, where we can distinguish that um, indicators basically have two effects. One effect is the knowledge effect. So if you look, for example, at the sheaf figures, you know, it's about the comparable facts that we put on the table and uh, which create a certain urgency to act create accountability to governments, you know, if they are able to, I don't know, close the wage gap, for example, or more women can participate in decision making positions. So, you know, these indicators have a knowledge effect. But at the same time, indicators have also a governance effect, because in terms of, you know, we want to um, address the issues that they indicate. And now it's very important that, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about quantitative uh, um, indicators here. It's about numbers. And numbers are uh, behave in a quite, or we behave in a quite particular way in relation to numbers. Because we think, you know, numbers are the bedrock of a systematic knowledge. Because it seems they are, you know, free of interpretation. They are neutral. They are merely descriptive. Numbers just belong to to the invariable rules of mathematics. So you know, it's it's the number, and that's it. And because numbers allow also to compare uh, the results, it's very easy to make decisions based of these numbers and believe that the decisions you take on these numbers is actually, you know, it's fair and impersonal because the numbers are neutral. And so it seems that once we do quantification, it's like, you know, scientific object objectivity now, you know, provides uh, an answer to a moral demand, you know, to be impartial and to be fair. But this often forgets really all the relations that are involved uh, when we designed those indicators initially. So quantification is a way of making decisions without seeming to decide. And I think in this context, it's important to remember a little bit what we know, what we've learned through feminist standpoint research. So this is about gender equality. And if we do these numbers and generate data, it's always oriented towards better improving social justice uh, towards challenging like a system of oppression of disadvantage that we want to remedy. It's not just about, you know, generating some data and facts. No, we want to use this in order to make a difference in the organization that we work. And this also often includes, as we've seen, that usually we try to 
involve or start on the margins. You know, we study from the bottom up in order to be sure that really also take on board the perspectives of those that might not be able to, um, you know, produce the tools uh, or or um, or have not been included uh, in this uh, initial setup. And um, since knowledge also is always socially embedded and partial, I think it's it's really key to understand, you know, the, the more plurality, the more plural viewpoints we can incorporate into, I don't know, an initial assessment of the gap, for example, the better because it reflects better the different needs that we find uh, in an organization or in a community. So I think this is really, this is really important. Okay, let me let me briefly introduce uh, measuring equality. I mean, this is something I think um, it, it's quite key for, for understanding also what we mean by measuring in the social science. I mean, of course, the way we measure is different. We do not measure liters, nor meters, nor kilometers or anything, but we measure social concepts. And the social science has developed its own quality criteria of what we of what means to have a good measurement. So on the first, it means it's objective in this time, in this way, how it's presented on this slide, it's not about uh, in an epistemological sense, it simply means that, you know, it shouldn't depend who measures. Uh, it, the person who measures shouldn't influence the result too much. I say too much because of course, depending on the instrument you use, I mean, you will get very different uh, responses to certain questions, for example, or in terms, you know, the huge age, age difference. Uh, this, of course, influences an interview situation, for example. But, you know, if you want to do a survey, for example, you shouldn't depend, the responses you get shouldn't depend too much of who does this. I think the other important thing is validity, and this is, all about um, a better understanding uh, what do we want to measure. Validity is about that you can be sure that the instrument you use really reflects or captures the social phenomenon you, you have in mind. So it's about developing a concept of explaining to yourself um, what is involved, even if it's not directly observable. So, for example, if we think about job satisfaction, you know, job satisfaction probably involves, you know, to have good relations with your colleagues, uh, that you're not stressed all the time. So the work intensity is okay to manage. Um, you have certain autonomy and skills and, you know, you're not threatened to get fired the next week. So these are elements that should be captured uh, in the job satisfaction and you develop a theory about that. And the way you measure it, you know, should reflect what you really have in mind. And there are different items in terms of convergent and discriminant uh, validity. Convergent simply means that related concepts, you know, if you measure job satisfaction and then you measure related construct, such as motivation, for example, or turnover intention, that this should correlate that when you get someone who has a high job satisfaction, you would expect that those people don't want to, you know, quit their job the next week. And discriminant means, you know, that things that are not related should not correlate. So if you have a high job satisfaction and also people indicate that they're always stressed or burned out. So basically there's a, there's a confusion there. Another important element is reliability and reliability simply means, I mean, if you apply the same measure several times, it should produce the same result on the same situation, right? So this is what I meant when you do the initial audit and later on come back and repeat the game, for example, I mean, if the instrument is reliable, it gives you an indication that any changes you detect, it's not because your instrument is just not working and produces very different results, but the instrument is okay. And the changes you detect is actually, you know, something in reality has changed. There's also an internal reliability, uh, which basically goes if you have 
certain indicator which comprises multiple items uh, that these are internally consistent. Let me show you what I mean with this, for example, with the with the work family conflict scale. As I said, this is a scale that we have introduced in the GAM. It forms part of the GAM. And as you can see, it has four sub items. So it is the four questions that are listed there. And there's actually a theoretical argument behind these four um, items, which are grouped in two and two. You can see this. The first two on the top is are related to how work interferes with a family. So you can be very stressed from work, which you know you take home. But work family conflict also involves the inverse direction. So when family, when your care responsibilities actually interfere with your work. So if we want to measure work family conflicts, you know, we have these four items and it allows us to say something, is it more work that interferes with family or is it rather that the family and care responsibilities interfere with work? I mean, this is interesting in terms of uh, gender differences already, since usually women are still uh, the ones who carry the burden of most of the care responsibility in house. You could expect that they score higher, how family interferes with work, while you know many men give priority to their work and don't care so much what's going on at the home in the family. So you could expect that it's their work responsibility that interferes with family. So in the analysis, then later on, you can examine this in more detail and see if these differences actually exist. The interesting part of this scale is that it has been used across Europe so it's been part of the International Social Science um, Survey. I can't remember now the exact uh, name of the survey, but it has been used about many countries and already there, uh, there are some indications how reliable this scale in terms of internal validity, it is across the countries. If you check out the, the publication that is cited, you will find there that the internal consistency of the instrument is actually uh, quite high. That means that when people rate high, you know, that work interferes with family uh, and uh, the other way around, family interferes with work, that this is consistent, that people don't say one score one on family interferes with work and then they score five on the second item. The other scale that we use um, is the masculinity contest culture. And here you see again, you know, how the uh, social phenomenon, phenomenon is conceived. It actually has four dimensions. So masculinity, how is masculinity, how does masculinity express itself in a work organization? They conceive this as a four dimensional item, which includes, you know, you have to, you cannot show weakness also often emotions, you know, you have to be strong, stamina, you can do everything, assume everything. So no, you, sorry, you, you're not allowed to show weakness and emotion. Then the other one is you have to show strength and stamina. You can, you know, you can assume a lot of work. A third dimension is, you know, work comes first. This is related to also to the work family conflict scale. And you know, the priority is work and what happens outside work, I don't care. And then it's also a very competitive environment. So it's all about, you know, winning on the cost of others, basically. And uh, these four dimensions are represented through these specific questions, which people then can rate on a Likert scale if they agree or not. Um, I think I don't go into the, the convergent validity, discriminant validity, but they show that these responses actually correlate quite highly in terms of the experiences of sexual harassment, burnout, lower job satisfaction. So if you have a high score on these uh, items, actually there's a good indication that, you know, something is going on, that, that there is a problem. Okay, so this was about uh, the measurement and explain you how this works in two selected scales of the GAM. 
And uh, let me also briefly introduce um, the other key concepts in terms of data protection. So we have always, we need always to mention privacy and confidentiality and the difference between two. I mean, privacy in the end is a more fundamental concept terms that it's really about the control you have about your information about yourself even what you decide you want to reveal from you or not and confidentiality is about once this information has been revealed to someone else i mean this person then there's a duty that this information is safeguarded and um, exactly and not not shared Privacy considers and limits the way in which we acquire information. So for a service, this means you have to give the option that people want to opt out, for example. In once they are in the middle of the questionnaire, for example, they say, no, I don't want to. So they should have the options to opt out and delete uh, their responses so far. And confident confidentiality then means really that you have to uh, store this information in a protected way uh, that it cannot be accessed. And uh, this especially gets uh, important for sensitive personal data, which involves racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious beliefs, trade union membership, genetic data, biometric data, health data, sex or sexual orientation. So I say uh, in next slide, what is included in the GIAM? Another option, this is important, is anonymization. Um, this is quite important also from the new GDPR point of view, because even though the GAM does not ask for any direct identifiers, which, for example, could be an ID, a name, an email address, so really, you know, unique identifiers that ask, that identify a person, it's still fairly easy, depending on the size of the people you ask, to uh, identify a person simply by looking at, you know, the gender and their role. Imagine you have a small research institute, you get 100 responses, and there are 10 managers, two of them are women. I mean, it's quite easy then to see, you know, who are the responses, who are the women, because there are only two. So there needs to be a clear understanding in terms of what you do with your data and even what type of results you publish in aggregated form. Um, this is also the reason why we have people to sign up, you know, the data protection agreement in order to be really be sure it's their responsibility to guarantee these um, rights under GDPR. The GAM includes uh, sensitive personal data. So we do ask uh, about sexual orientation, as I said. We do ask about disability, impairments, or long-term health conditions. Uh, we do ask about majority or minority ethnic group and trans, or do you have a trans history? We think it's important to ask these questions because, I mean, unfortunately, these are also the major dimension of social discrimination. So it's not just about gender, uh, but it's also about uh, sexual orientation. It's quite clear. I mean, you know, homophobia uh, is quite common on, on, on in some contexts. So sexual orientation is an important dimension of social discrimination, and it should be possible to really identify in the survey if uh, to what degree is this a place, is this place? And it's neat. I also need to point out that in the end, survey administrators, um, you need to check what's allowed in your national legislation. For example, you can't ask about race in Germany, if I'm not totally mistaken, so you can't ask about this. And if this is the case, you have to take it out. We don't ask specifically about this. We ask about majority or minority ethnic group because I think this is all that we uh, need to know. But in any case, you always need to um, double check with your national legislation that actually all the data you generate, you know, that this is um, okay. 
one word about intersectionality, and we are getting close to the end. Um, I mean, it, it's a complex phenomenon. There's lots and lots of things uh, written about this. The way we approach intersectionality inside the GAM and inside the survey, which is a very specific context, is that we include this dimension of uh, social discrimination, as I said, age, gender, sexual orientation, transgender, health impairments, class. So we have also a question about parents' education, ethnic minority, minority, and country of origin citizenship. We see intersectionality then happening on the level of the analysis. So if you combine um, several of these categories and analyze the results in terms of working conditions, job satisfaction, sexual harassment, or any of the other scales that are included in the GIAM, you can then, of course, analyze this according to these different intersecting categories. But I also say, I mean, this should always be backed up definitely by a qualitative approach as well, where you talk to people, talk about their experiences, which also then gives you a much richer, richer background to interpret this uh, quantitative data. Okay, so this was a quick, this was a quick overview of some of the key questions involved. I mean, most of this is documented in the manual that we've prepared for the GIAM as well, including issues of privacy, confidentiality, anonymization. Um, before we come to the question and answers uh, in the last 15 minutes, let me just quickly explain to you how we envision session two. As you know, this is going to be about uh, hands-on training. So we will create accounts on the Lime Survey platform, on our Lime Survey platform for you. Um, I have to be honest, I mean, we haven't done this for many people. Uh, I mean, we have set up quite several accounts, but as we plan to do this hands-on training, uh, I'm not sure how many simultaneous requests the platform can handle on the level of editing a questionnaire. So the thing would really be, um, if you are sure or fairly sure that you want to run the GAM uh, in the future, then please register for uh, session two and three. You see also there's a specific link. So it's not enough if you have registered for this session one, you need to re-inscribe or re-register for session two and three. And um, it, then we might see how many people um, sign up for this and uh, we'll see if I think there's going to be a limit in terms of uh, 15 accounts that we can uh, handle simultaneously. It also then becomes a little bit difficult to actually help you. We, we plan to subdivide this in, in, in groups and then give you, you know, the presentation and the guidance and then you in the subgroup try to uh, implement those changes directly in the survey. So if there are too many groups, it becomes a little bit uh, difficult also to handle so many. So our idea is please only sign up if you really think this is useful for you, that you uh, want to do it and uh, see a fair chance that you can um, uh, run a survey in the future. We encourage you also to sign up two or three for the same organization. I think this makes really sense because it will be the same GAM account and then you can work together on this. Um, because it also, you know, it provides background and you can think together what needs to be adapted and how should this be. Um, if you plan to, if you think now after this first session that this is not really something you're interested in or this could be something in the future, and you already registered for uh, session two and three, please send us an email so we can take you out and leave the place for, for others. If uh, worse comes to worse or good comes to good, let's say, I mean, if there's too many people, we might split it up in two sessions. Uh, 
let's say we have now planned session two and three with specific dates. And in the end, it's going to be probably first registered first served on this kind of uh, criterion. But we will hold then a first hands on training. And then uh, we'll be in touch with a second group who it's probably better to look for an alternative date further down the road in June or July, uh, and then have a dedicated session with a, with a second group. Um, I think this would be our proposal. We've come to the end of our session. I hope um, it was useful to provide you a first overview of what's involved. And um, yeah. Please take a minute to respond to the to the exit questionnaire, and I hope we'll see you on Friday when we start with the hands-on training.